So um, now we're going to, so I talked about splitting up the field into these three main areas. Now we're going to talk about one of those main areas, human computation. So these are for things where there is an easy task that you could do yourself if you had enough time, but the task is so big that you can't do all of it. Um, these are tasks also where humans are generally better than computers. So I want to be clear about what I mean here. So if you have an easy task, big scale problem, that's generally a good thing to give to a computer. Right? So adding up a bunch of numbers, that's very easy for you. You could do it. The difficulty comes from the scale, and so you ask a computer to do it. And so although there are many things that um, computers are very good at, and uh, there are still some things that humans are better than computers. And so these are the kinds of problems um, for which I think these human computation tasks are helpful. Uh, someone asked me, what are the problems where humans are better than computers? And I don't, I think that, that frontier is increasingly changing. And so I will not go out on a limb and say what I think, where that boundary will be in the future. Um, but uh, there are going to be some of these tasks, uh, particularly when it involves extracting sort of subtle human-specific meaning. I think, at least for a little while, humans will be better at it. And there are also very interesting ways that we can combine human effort and computer effort through a supervised learning process. Um, as I said here, I think increasingly, if you are going to have humans involved in these tasks, uh, rather than having the humans do all the work, I think a natural way to think about it is have the humans do enough work that they can train a computer how to do the work, and then have the computer do the work. So you can see this transition in Galaxy Zoo. So in the first iteration of Galaxy Zoo, they had the humans label all of the images. Then they said, this is not a good use of human effort. Let's have the humans label a bunch of the images, and then we'll train a supervised learning model to be able to accomplish this task. And then we'll be able to label as many images as we want. And so this is increasingly important in the astronomical setting because the amount of images that are being created in these new um, high throughput telescopes is increasing very, very, very rapidly. I don't know the exact numbers, but you could imagine like the amount of data increases by a factor of 10 every couple of years. I don't know the exact numbers, but something kind of like that. Uh, and so then like the people at Galaxy Zoo said, we can't get 10 times more volunteers every couple of years. That's just not possible. And so we have to think about better ways of combining human effort and machine effort. Um, and I think that these kind of human computation tasks will become increasingly important in social research as we move away from rectangular survey data to data that uses image, uh, images, text, videos, and so on, sound. So a lot of these things, the meaning of them is potentially difficult to extract for a machine, but is much easier for humans. And so I think these are the types of data where we will see human computation uh, in the social research. Um, so just to give an example of a paper that does this um, using text data, uh, and also uh, there's a couple things I really love about this paper, so I'm going to get to those in a second. But this is a paper by some uh, political scientists about crowdsourcing text analysis. So what they say in the abstract is um, empirical social science often relies on data that are not observed in the field but are transformed into quantitative variables by expert researchers who analyze and interpret qualitative raw sources. So this would be things like images, text, videos, audio. Um, while generally considered the most valid way to produce data, the expert-driven process is inherently difficult to replicate or to assess on the grounds of reliability. Using crowdsourcing to distribute text for reading and interpretation by massive numbers of non-experts we generate results comparable to those using experts to read and interpret the same text, but do so far more quickly and flexibly, uh, and also in a way that's easier to reproduce. So here's an example of the kind of text that they use. So these are uh, political party manifestos. So I'm not a political scientist, but my understanding is that uh, many political parties produce a document that sort of says what they're excited about. Um, 
And you might want to know what's in those documents. So if you're a political scientist, you might study the themes that are in those documents and how those vary over time and how those differ across countries and so on. So here's one from the Labor Party in the UK in 2010. Millions of people working in our public services embody the best values of Britain, helping empower people to make the most of their lives while protecting them from the risks they should not have to bear on their own. Just as we need to be bolder about the role of government in making markets work fairly, we also need to be bold reformers of government. Okay, so that's an example of what it, these documents are often like. Um, and then they wanted to code these sentences. Um, and so they wanted to code whether they were about um, economic policy, social policy, or neither economic nor social policy. And then if they were about economic policy, they wanted to code whether they were very left, somewhat left, neither left or right, somewhat right, or very right. And likewise, if they were social policy, they wanted to also label them on this five-point scale. So they sent these out through a crowdsourcing service similar to Mechanical Turk, which also had speakers of many different languages, because many of these documents are not written in English. They're written in the languages of the, the countries where they're created. Uh, so this is results from uh, the UK. So here are the expert coding estimates. And here are the estimates that come from the crowd. And so the different um, numbers here illustrate the different years. And the colors indicate the different political parties. But what I want you to focus on is how these two things line up very well. So the results from the crowd are very similar to the estimates that come from experts on both economic policy and social policy. So I've left out one step here that I would encourage you to read about in the paper. They did not do a simple aggregation of what the people in the crowd said. They did a number of other steps to combine the feedback they get from the crowd. They did it through a statistical model to help deal with some of the noisiness that comes from these non-expert ratings. Um, so this suggests that this is possible to do through non-experts. They can produce results that are comparable to experts. But what I really love about this paper is they focus on this data being better and not cheaper. And so they focus on it being better in the sense, this process being better and not cheaper, and they focus on it being better in the sense that you can actually, as new political issues become salient, you can go back and recode old manifestos by using a crowd service in a way that you can't with the experts. So they can't reconvene this group of experts from 1992 to code about immigration even though immigration is increasingly an important issue in Europe. So with this crowd service, actually very easy to do. The other thing that they emphasize about being better is that this process is reproducible. So they, in their paper, they code these documents, and then like six months later, they recode the documents, and they get very similar results. And then we could go and code the documents today, and we might get similar results. We might not, but we might. Uh, and so emphasizing having these non-experts involved as a way of increasing reproducibility is, again, focusing on something that is a scientific improvement, not just a decrease in cost. So in other words, they try to really make the point that experts are a bug and not a feature. And so I think increasingly, when you have tasks that you see in your research that are being done by experts, there may be a good reason for that. Like, I would not want volunteers to do surgery on me, for example. Um, but take a minute and think, like, are experts really a bug here, or are they a feature? What kinds of things would be possible if we could have this task being done by non-experts? OK, any questions about human computation? Natalie? Mm -hmm. reading all these manifestos that could very reasonably end up with different ratings. I mm -hmm. mean, that's something that psychology studies. And so what are they putting in the statistical model that like makes it perfect? Like, yes. how does that work? Yes, so I think, so the question is about sort of maybe accuracy of the responses that you get and the process of aggregating potentially noisy responses. Yeah, I think. Biasing? 
in psychology, the argument would be if it's the experts, at least you know whose biases you're dealing with. And if mm -hmm. it's crowdsourced, you're introducing maybe randomly distributed biases, but maybe not. Well, so yeah. So one of the things that the models that they d have do is they average a bunch of ratings. So a lot of, uh, if there's random noise, and if that is random and unstructured, then having lots of people rate the same thing, you can shrink that down. And so their, argue, their modeling depends a lot on that. And then the other thing is they model it, um, let's see, how do I explain this? So they're also able to potentially pull out uh, participants who seem to be giving crazy answers. So essentially, if you have, not crazy, let me clarify, answers that seem to be different than everyone else's answers. Maybe everyone is crazy, but uh, basically, if you have a whole data matrix of, if you have multiple responses per rater, and those, a given rater seems to be very different than what everyone else is doing, you can potentially downweight that person. But I think there are legitimate questions. It, that, that's kind of how the model works. I think there are legitimate questions, though, about if everyone has the same kind of bias, then that's obviously not going to get removed by averaging. Um, and for tasks that are more subjective, so in the social sciences, so Galaxy Zoo is the one that I talked about a lot with you know, spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies. and you know, Democrats and Republicans and labor voters and Tory voters probably don't see those stars very differently. Um, as we talk about these social things, though, it, it becomes increasingly potentially sensitive to who the raters are. And so then I think we can potentially use some of the techniques we learned about um, for surveys, where we try to think about who is actually participating and at least assess to what extent they seem to be similar to or different from the people we'd like to learn about. But then it involves being sort of more clear that there isn't so much a ground truth uh, anymore and that we want to sort of understand the variability. So another thing you could potentially do with this that you could not do with the experts is to say, what are the sentences that people disagree about the most? Yeah. That might actually be interesting. So another way of thinking of multiple raters with different perspectives as a feature and not a bug. Other questions? Tina? I'm just curious, so with like more mass collaboration projects happening and you know as they get more successful over time, do you think this requires a shift in our thinking of authorship and what counts as like contributions? Yes, absolutely. Um, so this uh, goes back to thinking of people as collaborators and not cogs. And so I think um, we have in science, we have a way, a mechanism for giving people who contribute to a piece of research credit, and that's co-authorship. And so I think we will increasingly have to decide to what extent uh, participating in a mass collaboration is something that we acknowledge through co-authorship or we acknowledge through other mechanisms. Um, we also have mechanisms like prizes. Um, this is another thing that things that you can put on your CV are generally ways of rewarding people for doing stuff that we think is important for science. And so I think these are things that we're all going to have to resolve. 